Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church, Westminster. We are so glad that you are joining us in our at-home version. Um, today we are live streaming on YouTube. Hopefully you are watching. Hopefully this is working. If it for some reason should cut out, do not fear, for Jesus is with us. And you can uh, catch the recorded version of this a little bit later. But until then, we are here, we are worshiping, and we are glad to be here today. I want to open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you so much for this opportunity to worship together. Even if we're doing that remotely, Lord, you are in this. Your Holy Spirit is all around us. Lord, let us today come before you boldly without any kind of fear in our hearts. Be with all of those who are affected by the coronavirus pandemic. For those who are sick, Lord, provide healing. For those who have lost jobs, Lord, provide financial help. Lord, we pray for our church and all of the people that are here and listening to us at home. And we pray, Lord, that you would be with them and guide them through this day. Lord, we pray for all of our congregational members who are in need of anything. Let them reach out to us at the office and we will get whatever they need to them as fast as possible. Lord, we pray for all of our neighbors and our friends who are in need right now. Give us new ideas and ways to help. Watch over our congregation. Watch over our church and our country and the nation. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship.
and we're excited that we're inviting God into our homes for this service, but during this time as well, we're saying, Lord, come and have your way. Make your kingdom uh, made known here on earth, um, and may people come to know you through this circumstance. May you turn something that the enemy meant for evil and turn it in, uh, to good for your good, Lord. Um, so that is our heart of uh, our posture of our heart this morning, and I know um, some of you are battling with fear. I've dealt with it this um, this week. It's been really hard to uh, hear all of the news, uh, be looking as a family guy with kids and pregnant wife, and <laughs> you know, it's just so much, uh, so much to think about, so much uh, as a protector and trying to have control of life uh, through all of that. And I really have had to check my own spirit and say, Lord, you have it all. You have control. And um, I'm trusting you uh, in the middle of all this chaos um, because I can't do anything about it, but I know that you can, Lord. Um, so let's continue worshiping in him this morning. Set you rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil our pain. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. No. Your church, we need your power in us. Your kingdom first, we hunger and we thirst, we refuse to waste our lives for you.
When I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There's another in the fly standing next to me. There was another in the waters holding back the sea. Should I ever need it? Set free this cross that bears a burden when another dies for me. There is another in the life. Yeah.
Again, welcome to First Presbyterian Church at Home Edition. We're glad that you've tuned in with us today. I thought we had a tremendously eventful and difficult week before last Sunday, but this week, wow. Folks, we are truly facing some unprecedented times in history, in the history of our country and our very lives. And yet, there are lessons to be learned from history. You see, our country, and indeed the entire world, has seen this before. There was an influenza pandemic in 1918 known as the Spanish Flu, even though it most likely originated in Haskell County, Kansas, with a combination of bird flu and swine flu mixed together and created a deadly flu virus that attacked the respiratory system. The, that influenza outbreak started in January of that year, and it was so severe that even though the flu wasn't one of those diseases that was reportable back then, a local physician named Loring Minor went to the trouble of, a, of alerting the U.S. Public Safety and Health Service anyway. And the report was the first recorded notice of anywhere in the world of uh, unusual flu activity that year. And within a week of that outbreak, 147 cases of the flu occurred in Haskell County, Kansas, with 48 that had pneumonia and 26 were dead. Several of the men from Haskell County who had been exposed to that virus went on to the U.S. Army camp at Funston in central Kansas. And then later on March 1st, the first soldier known to have the virus reported ill. This huge army base was training thousands of soldiers for combat in World War I. Within two weeks, there were 1,100 soldiers who were admitted to the hospital with thousands more sick in the barracks. 38 of them had died. Then the infected soldiers likely carried the virus to the other army camps around the United States, and pretty soon 24 of the 36 large training camps had outbreaks, sickening thousands of soldiers before carrying the disease overseas to France, where it spread and continued to spread. Meanwhile, back at home, the disease spread to the U.S. civilian communities as well. As soldiers were gathering to leave the United States and ship out to the war in Europe, a parade was scheduled in Philadelphia. On September 21st, physicians in Philadelphia worried that this could be the start of an epidemic. Dr. Cruzan, the Army, uh, the Chief Army Medical Officer at the time, said that Philadelphians could lower their risk of the flu by keeping warm and keeping their feet dry. The civilian infection rates climbed day by day, and Dr. Cruzan refused to cancel the upcoming parade. Infectious disease experts warned him just a day before the parade to cancel, but Cruzan went ahead with the parade anyway because he insisted that it must go on to raise millions of dollars for war bonds, and he downplayed the danger of spreading the disease. So on September 28th, the patriotic parade of soldiers and Boy Scouts and marching bands and dignitaries lined two miles of downtown Philadelphia with literally thousands and thousands of people standing along the sides of the prayer route, parade route, spectating. Just 72 hours after that parade, all 31 of Philadelphia's hospitals were full and 2,600 people were dead by the end of the week. As the Spanish flu swept across our country and the countries of Europe, people stayed home. Businesses closed. Ball games were not played and churches did not meet. It was an emergency. In fact, in Philadelphia, the head of the emergency aid pleaded with people, all who are free from the care of sick at home, report as early as possible to help with emergency work. But volunteers did not come. The Bureau of Child Hygiene begged people to take in, just for temporarily, children whose parents were either dying or dead, but yet few replied. Emergency aid again pleaded, we simply must have more volunteers and helpers. These people are almost to the point of death. Won't you come to our aid? Still nothing. Finally, the, ed of, the head of the emergency aid, the director, um, turned bitter and contemptuous. He said, hundreds of women have had delightful dreams of themselves as angels of mercy, but yet nothing seems to rouse them now. There are families in which the children are actually starving to death because there is no one to give them food. The death rate is so high, and yet everybody still holds back. But Philadelphia's misery wasn't unique. In Michigan, a couple and their three children were all sick, but a Red Cross worker said that none of their neighbors would come in and help. 
She then telephoned the woman's sister who came and tapped on the window but wouldn't go in the house and wouldn't talk to the Red Cross person until they were safely away from the premises. In New Haven, Connecticut, John Delano reported, normally when people were sick back in those days, people would bring food to the families. But nobody came. Nobody would bring food in. Nobody came to visit. In Kentucky, a Red Cross chapter chairman begged for help and pleaded. There are hundreds of cases of people starving to death, not from a lack of food, but because the well were so panic-stricken they would go nowhere near the sick. People said, we were actually afraid to breathe. You were afraid to even go out. The fear was so great that people were actually afraid to leave their homes, afraid to talk to one another. In Washington, D.C., William Sardo said, it kept people apart. You had no school life, you had no work life, you had no church life, you had nothing. It completely destroyed all family and community life. The terrifying aspect, he said, was that as each day dawned, you didn't know if you would be there for the sunset later in the day. American Red Cross reported the fear of the panic of the influenza was akin to the terror of the Middle Ages with the Black Plague. And it's been prevalent in many parts of our community, they said. At a time when community was needed most, it was suspiciously absent. Why? Why would the good people of this nation abandon their neighbors during this crisis? Fear. A pandemic of fear had gripped them. But friends, we have the recipe for fear. Satan brings us to the brink with a word, fear. I counter Satan's move with a word, Christ. Christ is the recipe for fear. Back to history. The governor of Tennessee ordered the closure of all churches. But the Russell Street Church of Christ in Nashville did not close its doors. Instead, the church approached the Red Cross with an offer to help. Their building became a temporary hospital because the city hospitals were overrun and they were turning people away. So the Russell Street members, along with two other neighborhood congregations, met and they poured all of their financial resources and all of their human resources into feeding and nursing the poor and the sick back to health. The influenza pandemic had opened a way for the enlargement of the Christian community. Churches in California at the time, Minnesota, West Virginia, Illinois, Pennsylvania, and Texas, all across the country suspended their regular services. Ben West, a man from Enos, Texas, recalled, he said, last Sunday was the first Sunday in 12 years that I failed to attend service. But then he said, we ended up having three funerals that day. And though the church was an assembly, we were all busy caring for the sick. Some died caring for others. J.D. Northcutt, an evangelist from Tennessee, fell ill with influenza, which turned into pneumonia, and he died at 43. And it was said during his funeral that he had given almost continual attention to those who were suffering and in need. And though churches suspended their large normal services, they did not cease to worship. People said, we worshiped from house to house. One pastor recommended that his congregants worship at home, as was sometimes done during the days of the apostles. Oddly, today, we find ourselves in very much the same situation. We have a worldwide influenza pandemic in the coronavirus. And we also are dealing with the effects of fear of this pandemic. What was true in 1819, or 1918 rather, is true for us today in 2020. Christ is the answer. Praise God. Christ is always the answer. Our topic today is joyful community. You may be thinking that to be an insensitive topic for a sermon today. I mean, with the rapid spread of COVID-19 coronavirus, you may not see anything to be joyful about. And with the recent order from Governor Gavin Newsom to avoid trips out of the house, avoid getting together with people, you might be thinking there's not much community either. But I want to paint a different picture for you today of what has been happening. People all over our community are coming together in new and bold ways to help each other out, to look after one another. Parents are taking to social media to share ideas for lessons and games and new ways for kids to learn during this challenging time. People are checking in and being neighborly to their older neighbors. People are spending more time with their family. People are calling each other on the phone, you know, actually using the phone app on their iPhones 
for, you know, a telephone. It's pretty awesome. Even Hollywood and rock stars are getting in on this. Actor Jennifer Garner has gotten her Hollywood friends together to read children's books to the 35 million American children who are home from school on YouTube. Rock stars are performing many little concerts from their homes to provide some entertainment for all of us in this troubled time. And today, we're worshiping together, sitting in front of our computer screens or iPhones or however you are watching this right now. Hopefully, you are using some of your at-home time to catch up on your reading in the Messiah Reading Bible. By today, you're halfway through the entire New Testament. Have you ever done that before? Have you ever read half of the New Testament in just four weeks? Isn't that awesome? So we're going to read a chunk of it here in just a second. But let's begin with a word of prayer. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, it is you we are relying on to save us, to carry us through this pandemic. It is you and your Holy Spirit we need to experience to have joyful community in the midst of the fear gripping our nation and our world. Speak to us, O oh Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. Our passage today comes from Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 through chapter 2, verse 8. Here we go. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then when I come and see you again, or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed but that you are going to be saved, even by God himself. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. We are in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I am still in the midst of it. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Do not look only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God, and he died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you, and now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain, and that my work was not useless. But I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want to share all... I want. To and I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice, and I will share your joy. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be God. We see from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi that he is calling the community of believers there to stand firm and to stand united. In spite of what he had endured personally, namely his imprisonment in Rome, he remained joyful and connected to the joyful community of believers, the church. Though he suffers for the gospel of Jesus Christ, he does so for them. To Paul, if his imprisonment leads to his own execution, he's okay with that. Because as he says in verse 20 and 21, whether I live or die, for to me, living means for, uh, living for Christ and dying is even better. 
Then he goes on to say that I am torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sake, it is better that I continue to live. So Paul calls the church to be united and a joyful community. You see, there were some divisions that had arisen within the church. People were quarreling with each other, namely two women were beefing, Iota and Syntyche. Paul appeals to them both to settle their disagreement because they each belong to the Lord. Likely, this disagreement threatened to split the church. So Paul calls the church in Philippi to a joyful community. I want to make four quick points about this passage. The first is, we should stand united against opposition from the outside. You see, the immediate context in first century Philippi was, where does their allegiance reside? Are they citizens of heaven, or are they citizens of Rome? You see, the Gentile believers in Philippi were very keen to remain Roman citizens, for that gave them certain rights and privileges. But many of their fellow countrymen believed that belonging to this Jewish sect called Christianity was contrary to their Roman citizenship, so there was a very real threat of persecution and suffering that went with this Christian experience. Paul calls them to stand firm against opposition from these outside forces. Today, amid the fear of this virus and what the world is facing right now, we too must answer the same question. Are we citizens of heaven or are we citizens of the world, citizens of the United States of America? Where does our allegiance reside? If we are citizens of heaven, Paul then calls us to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. So as you check in on your friends and family, especially those who are not believers in Jesus Christ, take this time to share with them the good news that gives you hope. We don't know how bad this thing is going to get. We cannot assume that, assume that we have an infinite amount of time to share this message, so get to it. Share with them the love of Jesus. Bring them into the grace, mercy, peace, and love through Christ Jesus. Christ will take away their fears and give them peace <clears throat> during this trying time. Paul then says that we are to stand united against divisions from within also. We don't know what the argument was between these two women, Iodia and Syntyche, but it threatened to divide the whole church. So Paul appeals to believers. He says, to make me truly happy, agree wholeheartedly with each other loving one another, working together with one mind and purpose. Paul encourages agreement, consensus, and purpose. That should be the aim of every church leadership team, to come together and to stand united in joyful community. How do we, who are still sinful, accomplish this? Well, fortunately, verse 3 and 4 tell us. Don't be selfish, it says. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out for only your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Since the earliest times of the Church of Jesus Christ, there has been a struggle with precisely what its relationship should be to the broader social order. During the first three centuries of the Church, they faced hostility from people in political power, and the emphasis lay on the depth of the corruption that was in those societies. The authorities had crucified Jesus, they had outlawed the preaching of the gospel, they executed James, they imprisoned Peter and Paul, they confiscated Christian property, and they, and, and they demanded that Christians worship the Roman gods or be fed to the lions or killed in the arena for entertainment. But after the eras of persecutions ended late in the 4th century, a conflict then arose from within the church itself, threatening to fracture the body of Christ. And we have now inherited the results of that conflict and the many divisions that exist known as denominational differences. Did you know that there are more than 4,000 Protestant denominations out there? But we must stand firm in joyful community as we face new threats like the coronavirus from the outside and differences on how we should as the church respond to that from within. You may be struggling with doing church online, on YouTube or Facebook Live, or, but you know what? The beautiful thing is, is that we can still worship. We can still experience things together. We are God's church, people. During this time of fear, be Christ to those around you. But how can we do this? How do we do this? Fortunately for us, 
we have an example, and a perfect one of that. That example is laid out in verses 5 through 11. And these seven verses have received more attention from New Testament scholars and Christian theologians than any other passage in the book of Philippians. In fact, it easily qualifies for inclusion among the most hotly debated passages in the entire Bible. This is the great kenosis statement, right? And it gives us maybe one of the best descriptions of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. This passage speaks to Christ's pre-existence, his equality with God, his identity with humanity, and the costly nature of that identity. The passage also provides insight into Christ's status after his incarnation, and into the future submission of all creation to his authority. You know, we can talk about the theological implications of this passage through the night and on into tomorrow, but I fear that many of you will log off by then. So let's focus our attention on a couple of things. First, from the moment that somebody is born, we urge through crying out for others to meet our needs. The infant cries until mom comes and feeds him or her or changes him or her. The toddler misbehaves until dad puts down his phone and plays with her. That actually happened yesterday in the park. Um, older siblings demand privileges at least equal or in proportion or maybe even greater than their brothers and sisters. And on and on and on it goes until adults are striving for higher paying jobs, bigger houses, more prestigious cars, and more extravagant vacations. What began as a survival instinct quickly becomes an expression of our fallen human nature. But for people to live successfully in joyful community with other people, this instinct to dominate one another must be restrained in numerous ways. Through laws and rules, if not, the community will collapse. But Jesus Christ, he challenged all of this. Commentator Frank Fieldman writes, The incarnation of Jesus Christ represents the antithesis of this human drive to dominate. And although he had access to the glory and the power of his identity as God, he could have exploited that glory and power to dominate over all creation. But Jesus considered his deity an opportunity for service and obedience instead. His deity became a matter not of getting, but of getting. Not of being served, but of serving. Not of dominance, but of obedience. And he paid a price for that choice. He died on the cross. A death reserved for a criminal. But he made that sacrifice for you and I. For the forgiveness of our sins. So friends, fear not. For Jesus has come before us. Laying aside his divine glory and the privileges that he had because he was divine. And instead he became humble. He submitted, he obeyed, and he sacrificed for you. At the end of our passage, Paul sums up his admonition that the believers in Philippi stand united. Working out their salvation in joyful community. Here is what we learn from verses 12 through 18. Joyful community happens when we do everything without complaining and arguing. When we are being lights shining brightly in our community that is dark and perverse. Did you guys know that many years ago a woman had a prophetic vision about our church right here? That the light of the Holy Spirit was shining out of all of the windows and like streams of fire it went out into our neighborhood and our community, bringing the gospel to those who needed to hear it. Today is a call to action. Do not waste this opportunity that God is giving us to be the church during these unprecedented times, during this pandemic, the like of which we have not seen since 1918. Folks, are you a citizen of heaven or are you a citizen of earth? Will you be paralyzed by a spirit of fear or will you be unleashed by the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you? People all around you are afraid. People both inside and outside of the church are in need right now. Some of you listening to my voice right now are in need. We are here. We are ready. Call us, message us, email us, whatever. When no one else will come, we will. We will answer the call. I have spoken to people all week who are just waiting to put into action what God is calling them to do. Satan has fear. 
We have Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message today. And even though for most of us, Lord, we've never seen anything like this before, and it's frightening, and it's scary, and we are concerned. How much contact should we have with people? What should we do? Should we hole up in our homes? Should we go out into our communities and help? What are you calling us to do, O oh Lord? Whatever it is, let us not respond in a spirit of fear, but let us respond in the strength and power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. Lord, this is the time that the church can come together as that joyful community, in spite of the fact and the sorrow and the fear and the concern that is everywhere in our community right now. Let us help one another. Let us hold each other up. Let us call each other on the phone just to see how we're all doing. Give us new ideas and new ways to be the church and to spread the glory of your gospel message to the ends of the earth. You are, Lord, the recipe for all our fears. And what Satan desired for evil, you will use for your glory and for the good of those who believe in you. Bless everybody today who is listening to this at home right now. Let us turn to you in faith. Let us turn to you in love. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen.
see it, you're working. Even if I don't feel it, you're working. Let's sing that together in the living rooms. Um, just welcoming God into your home through the season.